Lots there has really, really struck me, and a lot of trends between all of your uh, all of your uh, inputs here. Um, peer relationships, absolutely top of the agenda here. Mentoring and collaboration. Uh, but then there is also uh, also a theme there about adults as being uh, the role models for empathy and also being very clear about their intentions that they are there to support uh, to support the adolescents um, and practical strategies across the piece here. So very, very, uh, very encouraging. I hope there's a lot there to, for you to take away with you. I'm wondering if there are any, uh, any questions for, for any of the panellists. Okay, we're up to three already, really keen. We'll start, uh, start from the back then, maybe. Yes. Yeah, hi, um, my name's Elsa. I was just going to ask John, um, you know when you were talking about the adolescents like, like rewiring their brains, is there any sort of difference with, <coughs> excuse me, between boys and girls, and how that process goes on. Um, did I confess at the beginning that I'm not a neuroscientist? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, from a neuroscientific perspective, I can't tell you that the answer to that. Um, from you know, developmentally, we know that uh, generally girls tend to develop and mature a bit quicker than boys, but I, I can't tell you that from a neuroscientific perspective. Yes. My question is to go on to when you were given the data for the groups that have progressed and made a comparison, mm. what you didn't say was what their individual starting points were. Mm. So they mentioned what the progress was through. I was with the groups that were single borderline that had moved from C to D, I was with the people that moved from E to A. How big a progression jump was it? I moved two groups or D target grades and you moved them on a huge amount or are they all coming from different sort of places? No, I think that's why I said um, before I was saying about the data, I'm quite reticent about you know making big claims from what such a small um, pilot study and also quite a small group of students within the student body as well. Um, and in terms of where they were starting from, these were um, the the group of underachieving boys were from uh, across both set four and set three classes. So this was moving them from a D. Mostly it was from a D to C. We didn't. Uh, we actually did, but that was kind of we didn't look at it from the perspective of oh right, I'm going to target these D to C students. It was actually just the way I did it was who's underachieving and looked at the uh, Turkish and Caribbean boys and they're all in sets four or set three, those ten students who I was looking at. So with those children, so because it was a small group, so for example, you know, when we're looking at, you know, moving from uh, 14% one year to then, you know, 60% next year, because of this is a relatively small proportion of the whole cohort, you know, one child can be 5%. So I think statistics can be a bit dangerous, so I was, you know, but, um, but from the students' perspectives, they enjoyed it, they liked it, you know, they showed more engagement, it's been successful, it seems to be working this year. But it just so happened that it was D to C. I um, no, just because my focus was on the Turkish and Caribbean boy uh, underachievers, it was I didn't we didn't have any of those underachieving students in set two or set one, which again is indicative of, of the issue that we actually have, and the fact that last year in our sixth form there were only two Turkish boys, and and that's a real that's a real problem. That's actually you know, and this is something that is uh, you know. An, an issue, a well-known issue in North London and in East London generally as well. So um, so it wasn't, I mean, if it was a case of, I think sick form mentoring is powerful for full stop and it's just in terms of you have to choose where you deploy your, your resources and at the moment, I said it's been widened to the um, rest of school and at the moment with science and MFL and that's not been focused on the CD borderlines it's just been underachieving students full stop. So that's moving some, so for example, I've got a girl in my form who's being mentored by a sick former for Spanish. 
and that's because she's an A student but she's sort of languishing on at the bottom of a B and so it's actually about moving her up into up into an A. So yeah. A question for Chris? Yeah. yeah. Um, my question's to Carol. Um, I really liked your um, story about the, the magic classroom. Um, I was just wondering how um, curriculum and pastoral um, Middle East can work together to make sure all students engage like that. Have you got any ideas? Yeah, well, that's what I do every day. Right. <laughs> so you will. Uh, well, communication is the key, really. It's about um, both being aware of what's going on and um, both having a clear idea of what, what you want to achieve, what your goal is with that student and what, what your aim is for asking for support or intervention. And um, we're very clear about, you know, teachers taking responsibility and managing behaviour in their classrooms. We're not about to step in and do everything for them. Um, it's about those really hard to engage children or families. And, it, and that really is, is the main support that we can give. So it's not admin support and it's not um, it's not about you know going in there and threatening the students at the start of the lesson and, and imposing sanctions. It really is about um, us motivating and sometimes the teacher and the students. So I think sometimes the, the temptation is for us to go, oh well it's a behaviour issue therefore it must be pastoral or they're underachieving therefore it must be curriculum. So do you have regular meetings with curriculum teams? Yeah, we have um, what is called um, RAP meetings every yeah. week and um, a different subject every week where we meet with the um, curriculum leaders and we talk about um, progress and we really try to steer away from the word behaviour. You know, um, we, it's a no excuses thing, you know, but if um, there is a child for whatever reason, generally it's because of some sort of trauma or domestic circumstances isn't performing, then we put in all the sort of uh, support with the child and the family and we work closely. Sometimes the teachers can do things for us. Um, one of our art teachers does some art therapy with one of our um, students. You know, so sometimes we can bring them in to work, to work with us. But we don't, do, we don't go into classrooms and sit in there with students. It's, it's really um, working together. Benny, Camilla, do, do you have experience that you want to share how you work with us all leaders? Um, well, I mean, as a, the head of English, yeah. um, I have quite uh, a few conversations with the pastoral team. Um, we don't have weekly meetings, but I mean, I think there's that constant dialogue that you get in schools anyway. Um, I think if you're working in a system where um, you're, you're getting information about the students. I mean, for me, it's really key to have the information about students. And this is what I mean about kind of understanding them and empathising with their um, particular circumstances. Um, it's so easy to get trapped in a cycle of they're over there and, and they're a block of students I have to deal with and, and, and not to see them as human beings with, with real life experiences. Um, so I think schools that really kind of push that whole... Um, we're going to provide you with a potted history of this child without kind of um, violating any of these CCP issues. But that, for me, creates the biggest difference mm -hmm. because then when there is an issue about misbehaviour or disruption in a lesson, you can kind of go to that child with a, a bit more of an understanding of where they're coming from, have the empathy with them in the first place. And that's what I mean by modelling it. You know, you're modelling it for them um, so that they can learn to behave in the same way. Yeah, quite, quite often, I mean, I'm not talking from a subject leader's perspective because I'm second in department and Icky stage four, so I know my head of department, for example, has has a different, you know, is, has far more engagement with pastoral leaders than, than I do, but um, but um, it's it's present all all the time, so, I mean, if there's, if a student is sent out of a lesson or if there's any kind of behavioural issue, then then that's always logged on, on, our, on Sims, I'm sure that's, you know, um, that's always logged on Sims, and then the head of year reviews that every day. And, um, and if a student's sent out, then it's just our protocol that we, um, whoever it is who receives that child who's been sent out of a lesson, will inform their head of year as well. So there's always that constant kind of dialogue on a daily basis between the head of year and the um, and the head of learning area. 
so they always know um, what's going on with a particular student on a daily basis and and if that child's been sent out for something quite serious or, or what have you and and we have six o'clock detentions for serious things and then um, a parental interview you know a meeting the next day um, you you can't give a six o'clock detention without having a discussion with the head of year so it has to be pastoral is embedded in how we deal with behaviour so there's that dialogue all the time. We also don't use the word behaviour, we use attitude to learn. <laughs> and also is it RAP W or RAP R? RAP. Um, uh, time for a couple of more questions. Uh, yes please. Uh, my questions uh, uh, for Camilla as well. Uh, with the uh, magic um, Carol. Sorry, Carol. Sorry, Carol. <laughs> uh, Carol, sorry. Um, sorry, Carol. <laughs> 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 Carol. Um, with regards to the magic class, um, have you, is there a, a, ever a situation where a couple of kids have been sort of singled out as the main disruption to the rest of the class? And what I would imagine that they would react initially quite sort of hostile towards that. Um, I wouldn't say hostile, there's a lot of denial that goes on. Right. But when the general consensus is that it's them, they have to take it on board. But um, one thing I, I don't know, it's just our school, but whenever I deal with, I'm also the bullying coordinator, whenever I deal with any bullying issues, there never seems to be any comeback. I know that's what the victims are most afraid of, that's why they won't speak out, but there never seems to be any comeback. The students seem to... Once we explain to them, again, the impact they're having on someone else and why they may be doing it, um, it they seem to accept it and, and try, to try to move on. I just think that that fits in with um, my, my thinking in terms of making things explicit, that you know, they might not really have thought about the impact. It, might, you know, it may not be in the front of their mind what the impact of their behaviour is on other people, but by you know you using empathy in a very kind of explicit way, um, uh, you know there's a kind of restorative. There um, is. We do a lot um, of restorative justice. It's yeah. very powerful. Thank you. Do you have any uh, any more questions? Yes. Um, I have a question that's mainly for you, Carol, and actually for the other English leaders. Um, we're looking at ways of embedding literacy um, across the school, and we've got a very um, yeah, no, it's everyone's fault. Uh, we've got a very um, um, in grade program called Accelerated Reader and um, every key stage three child is assigned up to it and very engaged but it is a, like the minutia like commas and full stops and mm. capital letters that we are looking to really embed because unfortunately they're coming to us from primary school without those skills and so um, we were looking at things like SAM learning I know you've mentioned in here that you do some literacy through pastoral so I wondered like, what have you seen work best that, in, that actually doesn't just train them for an exam, but embeds the skills and just kind of forms whatever. Well, I start, one of my teaching leaders' um, projects was I started a um, literacy group within, I was head of year seven then, and they became um, literacy ambassadors mm -hmm. from badges and things. And I brought all different types of kids into that group, not just high achievers. I brought some sort of level three students in again as well. And, and empowering them through that, and they, they sort of led a program um, for the other students about um, spelling, punctuation, and grammar. You know, quite basic stuff, and things to put on desks. They made things to put on desks as, as reminders. But also with the challenging students, I I get them involved in literacy through fun. So um, they love their sanctions with me. They ask for an extra week all the time because we go to the <laughs> library at lunchtime and we play Trivial Pursuit and. Um, we read and then we read things like Match the Day magazine and we have a big dis d debate about it and you know all sort of really fun things like that and my Christmas cards this year, the, the last group that I had all of these boys, they all sent me a Christmas card and they all wrote little quotes on it from uh, the fun that we'd had you know in the little literacy lunchtime group so I find that you know I'm teasing <coughs> the kids and having a bit of fun with them they don't even realise that there's literacy involved. And then we had a competition, I had them all on report, and we had a competition to see who could get the best words, best positive word to describe their behaviour. 
and it started off with like good and, and then it was fantastic and brilliant and then coming out they were getting their teachers to think of words I'd never even heard of and it was amazing and, it, it, and just by doing that they wouldn't get that word at the end if they hadn't displayed that behaviour in the lesson. Benny, can I, do you have any, any practical strategies you could suggest to implement? Um, it's, it's, I mean, I've worked in three different schools now, and um, my first two roles are very much kind of whole school literacy based. I think the, the key thing with embedded literacy strategies is making sure every department is involved, that it is everybody's responsibility. Um, I've done quite a lot of research around it as well, and it's not something we have at my school at the moment, but there's a, a, a really, really brilliant bit of research, I wish I could remember what it's called, about um, the impact of whole, uh, whole sentence, full sentence policies um, in, in responses from students. Um, you know, we're talking significant impact here. I think there's the ridiculous statistic about you know, the, amount, the average amount of words a student utters in a, in a classroom. I think it's something like four words. Um, and full sentence policies really kind of make it for students to construct, um, not only kind of using the kind of correct grammar, it, they construct their ideas in an articulate way. Um, and I've seen, you know, with small kind of groups in, in my lessons, for example, I've seen the impact of that. So I've got a set five year 11 class um, who have significant li literacy difficulties. Um, and it's only since I've been saying to them, no, you have to explain that in a full sentence. Actually, now you've done that, can you start that sentence with a connective? Um, so that you're actually linking up the ideas in this classroom that they've started to see an impact on their writing. Um, and to that effect, we kind of rolled out across the school so now every subject has a full set of connectives um, on their wall on the walls so I think humanity started off and then it got rolled out everywhere else um, but that's made a real real difference and I know the kind of nuts and bolts are important but in terms of what exams are asking students to do and uh, that skill of explanation in particular doing um, cross-curricular training on what explanation looks like in different subjects tends to to make quite an impact as well yeah, we've just um, started um, very recently actually, um, so in terms of impact I, I don't know, but um, having a whole school weekly literacy focus, uh, which I know a couple of schools um, do already, and, um, and so basically just a very, um, starting with the very, very basics, every year group has, has this very, very basic slide for example, um, this week it's, uh, it's the start of it and it's just what is a sentence and next one kind of what is a clause and then a, you know, and a, a whole year's worth of weekly literacy focuses and it's form tutors who will deliver it um, and so it's very very simple, very basic, form tutors are given just this slide to go through with their form groups and then every teacher of every department that is the literacy focus that's also displayed um, throughout the school for that week as well so it just kind of it also um, just for those children who who might feel that they should know and so they they're slightly embarrassed about not actually you know really knowing what they think they should um, it just serves as, as a reminder um, for those children and to, you know for children who think oh god I know what sentence is you know we have like a little extra challenge whatever at, at the bottom and you know with this slide and, and it's just there and it's also just to put the emphasis on it as well and just to say look it's important not just in English but you know throughout mm -hmm. and um, and so so that's something that we're we're starting um, but yeah thanks there will be lots of time afterwards to exchange strategies on engaging pupils uh, later uh, over drinks. Uh, I want to move swiftly on to...